beautiful housing for all a real priority. Now, the Jewish Museum in London first opened its doors to the public back in 1932. And now, after a £10 million, two and a half year redevelopment, the grand reopening's next Wednesday. Safraz Manzur went along to explore the rich history of one of Britain's oldest immigrant communities. When you think of Brick Lane, the chances are that you think of Indian restaurants or that novel by Monica Ali. But this part of the East End was once home to another minority community, also working class, also demonised for being the other. Long before the Indian restaurants, this was home to a thriving Jewish community. But the Jewish presence in Britain can be traced much further back than the 19th and 20th centuries. Here in Milk Street in the city of London, a mikveh or ritual cleansing bath dating back to the mid-13th century was found. Its presence here, just decades before the Jews were expelled from Britain in 1290, is a powerful reminder of just how deeply embedded Jewish people are in British history. Now, the Jewish Museum is finally putting on public display this 13th century mikveh. It's one of the oldest existing artifacts of the Jewish presence in this country, and that's why it's one of the first things you see when you walk into the museum. The museum shut its doors to the public for two years while they expanded their existing Camden site, which was once an old piano factory. They spent £10 million from the lottery and private donations on a modern refit. I'm interested in this museum not only because it's the only permanent exhibition space dedicated to a minority in London, but also because it seems to me that the story of Jews in this country offers some really interesting lessons for us all about questions of identity, belonging, tolerance, and the story that Britain tells about itself. As far as the Jewish experience is concerned, the first Jewish settlement, which was a high Middle Ages settlement, ended in the expulsion of the Jews, the entire Jewish population in 1290, so not much welcome there. But as, as far as the second settlement, which is, dates from about the middle of the 17th century to the present, I think, broadly speaking, the experience of Jews in this country has been a relatively benign one. Many of the Jews who arrived in this country came because they were fleeing violence and persecution. Knowing this, the seemingly innocent objects that they brought here become loaded with symbolism and value. What's interesting is that there's a lot of artifacts here which will date back to only a couple of generations from the people who might be coming here. My mum was born in Nazi Germany um, in 1939 and here there's uh, an appreciation of Jewish refugee children who stayed in a holiday camp in Britain. I don't think my mum's name is actually in that list but yeah, I mean when I come here I do get a strong sense that I don't have to go back very far, I mean my mum is still alive um, and this is my family involved in, in this stuff which is one of the things about being from an ethnic minority, being from refugee stock is particularly as you get older, I think, you kind of feel the history live within you more and more, and you think, God, I am actually part of this historical shift. Where the museum really comes alive is where it focuses on personal histories, from the rabbi who persuaded Cromwell to readmit the Jews into England, to boxer Daniel Mendoza, the greatest Jewish celebrity of the 18th century. Here, in the Holocaust Gallery, the museum gives respectful space to one extraordinary survivor's life story and is a poignant and terrifying reminder of the dangers of fascism. Now this is a photo of the Battle of Cable Street and my parents were this, they were only 16 years old and this was where the idea was that Mosley, the leader of the British Union of Fascists, was going to march through the East End and the Jews and the Dockers said, no, no way, he's not going to come through. I mean, this is 36, so this is only three years before fascism did divide and destroy people. And after all, this area was blitzed. But also it's informed me throughout my life about persecution. You know, you must always fight persecution. Never take it, never take it. It's weird to see 
things that are like so obviously emotional like the Holocaust display and all the timelines and the relics from ancient synagogues and things and then see this which is this is something I can relate to whereas the other things I, I've learnt about but it's very much like a classroom scenario or hearing someone speak but this is something that I can immediately understand because it's my school and it was the school that's like evolved into my school so like there's a article about aliens to, to think of the word alien applying to Jewish people just because they're living in Britain I don't know it's weird but uh, but I'm glad we've got past that <laughs> sort of thing. The prejudice that Jews faced has not gone away entirely. Anti-Semitic attacks are on the rise again. But there is a confidence in Jewish identity that speaks to the length and the strength of the Jewish experience in Britain. One of the most evocative parts of the museum for me is this section devoted to the East End of London. It's here that the lives of working class Jews are brought to life. And today the Jewish community is relatively prosperous, but when you look at some of the artefacts here, you realise that that prosperity is thanks to the sweats and the hard work of men and women who were bakers, furniture makers and tailors. David, your grandparents' trade was entertainment. That's right. My mother's parents were in the Yiddish theatre. Um, in fact, this is sort of like a little family museum within the Jewish Museum. Here we've got, um, we've got pictures of my... This is my granddad here. He was a writer and a prompter at the Yiddish theatre. Um, and my grandmother was an actress in the Yiddish theatre. So they started in Vienna. And then just before the war they came and they were in the Yiddish theatre here in London. Am I right in saying that The Merchant of Venice was translated? Oh, yes, yeah. There's, there's a thing where um, you would often get posters saying... Um, a Merchant of Venice by William Shakespeare, um, translated and improved by the, whoever the translator was. Have you heard of Shylock, the Merchant of Venice? Yes? What do you mean Shakespeare isn't Yiddish? It is when we do it. Speaking for yourself, how Jewish do you feel? Well, Yiddish is very convenient for me as a, as a Jew in the 21st century. It means that I can express my Jewish culture um, in a way that isn't religious or isn't necessarily political. Um, and a lot of the issues that the Jews who wrote in Yiddish faced then are issues that I as a Jew face now. It's questions of how to be distinctive inside a melting pot. Yes, how to be distinctive, whether to be distinctive, and also the questions of what is Jewishness? Is it a culture? Is it a race? Is it a religion? I am a Jew. Hath not a Jew eyes? Have not to do hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions? Do you think there are lessons in the story of the Jewish presence in Britain for other migrant communities who have arrived in subsequent waves and subsequent episodes? Well, I think every community, every uh, uh, immigrant community has to make its own history. Um, uh, perhaps there are lessons, but I think that uh, the historical circumstances now are so different Contemporary circumstances are so different to the waves of Jewish immigrants over the last three, four hundred years, it's hard to draw any parallels. Now it seems to me, just walking around this, that, that, that that's come, Jews have come out of their Jewish closet a bit and said, no, we are a part of Britain and we have been for a while, so come and look at it. But people who are not Jewish, who might see themselves as like, you know, whatever, just an ordinary British person, would come and see this and not feel like, oh, this is something else. They would feel that this is part of my history too, because these people came here and they contributed and they did this and that, and I was part of the fight against the enemies who were trying to kill them and all the rest of it. The lesson I think that other immigrant communities can draw from this is that it is possible to have a distinctive identity and be fully British, but these things take time and the road to full acceptance is a long one.